In section 9.1, we will be introduced to hypothesis testing. I hope you're all mentally ready for this. Here's a scenario. A company says that they have invented a pill that can increase a couple's chances of having a girl. To test this, they take 30 couples who volunteer, and out of the 30 couples, 19 of them have a girl. Here's a question. Is this enough evidence to support the company's claim that the pill increases a couple's chance of having a girl? Or could the 19 couples have had a girl just by chance? Now, let's take another scenario. What if 26 out of 30 couples had had a girl? Could this have happened by chance? How do you know? Is there a particular cutoff that will convince us that the pill works? Companies make claims all the time and it is up to statisticians to test these claims. This is what hypothesis testing is used for. We wish to test whether or not a claim about a parameter, remember a parameter is a measurable characteristic of a population, is true or not. Such as the claim that taking the pill in the above example will increase a couple's chances of having a girl. The problem, we don't know and we can never know the true value of a parameter. Thus, we can never prove a claim whether or not it's actually true. So we can never show whether a parameter is exactly equal to some value. So what can we do? Instead, we can use a statistic, one that is an unbiased estimator of a parameter, as evidence to, uh, to show whether or not a given claim is true. Here's a process of hypothesis testing. In the US, if man is on trial, then in our judicial system, we must assume the man is innocent. This is the status quo. We never assume the man is guilty. We assume that the man is innocent. Then the prosecution must gather evidence. They must present this evidence, and they must show that if the man was really innocent, then this evidence would be extremely unlikely. Therefore, it is much more likely to believe based on the evidence that the person is guilty. That's the logic of a hypothesis test. We first define a null hypothesis. A null hypothesis given by the notation H sub zero is the status quo belief or an accepted fact. For example, the status quo belief here is that the man is innocent. That is a null hypothesis. That is the accepted fact, unless proven otherwise. And we also have to define an alternative hypothesis which challenges a null hypothesis. So in this case, the prosecution is challenging the fact that the man is innocent and they will present evidence to prove this. In the example with the, with the pill, the null hypothesis, the accepted fact, is that the proportion of girls born is 50%. About half the uh, babies born are girls, about half the babies born are boys. So the null hypothesis, the status quo belief, or the accepted fact, is that the proportion of girls born is equal to 0.5. Here's what the company claims. The company, the company challenges this null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis would be that the pill increases a couple's chances of having a girl. This is what the company is claiming, that their pill increases the chance of having a girl. So the probability of you having a girl after taking a pill is greater than 0.5. That's the first step. The second step is we look at the data and calculate the test statistic. We will talk more about this later on. This is the same thing as gathering evidence in the, um, in the, the example with the trial. Step three, we find the probability of obtaining the statistic given our null hypothesis is true. In other words, how likely is it to observe data like the data we got from our sample, assuming that the null was true? So in the case of the, of the trial, we assume that the man is innocent. The alternative hypothesis is that the man is not innocent. This is what the prosecution is claiming. Okay, so what does a prosecution do? They gather evidence. And then they present the evidence and they state that if the null hypothesis was true, if the man in fact is innocent, then this evidence wouldn't exist. This evidence would be very unlikely. So we wouldn't observe this data 
we wouldn't observe this evidence if the null hypothesis was true. So because this evidence is being observed, which counters the fact that the man is innocent, then this null hypothesis, it must be false. In the example with the pill, we would like to assess how likely is it that 19 out of 30 couples in the study uh, gave birth to a girl, assuming that the null hypothesis is that 50% of all couples give birth to a girl. This, this concept is kind of confusing, so we will talk much more about this in class. Step four, if the probability of this result is small, then we reject the null hypothesis due to sufficient evidence against it. Otherwise, we fail to reject it due to insufficient evidence. For example, if we had sufficient evidence against the null hypothesis, then we would reject the null hypothesis and say the man is not innocent. If we could not find sufficient evidence, then we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So here's some notation. The null hypothesis is denoted by H sub zero. The alternative hypothesis, you, you will see it as both H sub A or H sub one. The null hypothesis always has an equal sign. This is the status quo or the, what is believed to be true. And often, the alternative hypothesis is what we will try to show. And the alternative hypothesis always challenges the null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is rejected, then we accept the alternate hypothesis. The, null, the alternate hypothesis always has an inequality. It's either a less than, a greater than, or not equal to. And we will talk more about this um, in our examples. A one-sided alternative hypothesis is if it's a less than or greater than. A two-sided, all we have to show that uh, it is not equal to the null hypothesis. And again, we'll talk more about this uh, in, our, in our examples. Here are some tips. Because we're testing a claim about a parameter, always use parameter notation. If you have a mean, use mu. If you have a parameter, use p. And for standard deviation of a mean, uh, use sigma. And not use statistic notation. Think about the alternative. Are we interested in only one direction, greater than, less than, or just showing that a difference exists? In other words, not equal to. Let's write some uh, null and alternate hypothesis. A school administrator claims that 60% of seniors who attend a four-year college after graduating. That's a null hypothesis because this is the believed fact. This is the accepted fact. This is what the school administrator is claiming, that currently 60% of students attend a four-year college after graduating. Remember, 60% is a proportion. So for proportion, we would use p equals to 60% or 0.60. A 12th grade teacher thinks this is wrong and that more than 60% of seniors from this high school attend a four-year college after graduation. She randomly samples 45 students to survey. We want to write the null hypothesis, which is p equals to 0.60. This is the accepted fact. And the alternate hypothesis, what the teacher is claiming, is that more than 60% of seniors attend a four-year college. So she's claiming that the proportion of seniors who attend college is actually more than 60%, or P is greater than 0.60. So keywords to look for is in the, in the claim, the alternative hypothesis, do we have more than, do we have less than, or do we have not equal to? And that will determine the sign of the alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis will always have an equal sign. So to recap, the null hypothesis is the accepted or believed fact, the status quo. And the school administrator is claiming that 60% of seniors attend a four-year college. No one has questioned it, so it is the accepted fact. The teacher is claiming this is wrong and that actually more than 60% of seniors attend a four-year college. So P will be greater than 0.60. In both the null and the alternate hypothesis, the proportion will be the same. The only difference will be the sign. John claims his free throw shooting percentage is 85%. To prove it, he shoots 50 shots and makes 37 of them, giving him a 74% shooting percentage. Write a null and an alternate hypothesis to test John's claim that the shooting percent is 85%. 
Okay, so what is his, what is his, uh, what is the status quo? What is the believed fact or accepted fact? So the accepted fact, which no one's disputing right now, is that John's shooting percentage is 85%. The null hypothesis is, this is a proportion, it's 85%, so we would use P equals to 0.85. Someone challenges this, so the alternate hypothesis is that his shooting percentage is not 85%. So the alternate hypothesis is that his shooting percentage is not 85%. It could be lower, it could be higher, but it's not 85%. So the alternate hypothesis is P is not equal to 0.85. Let's look at the last example. An e-commerce research company claims that 45% of college students rent rather than buy their books. A consumer group is suspicious of the claim and thinks that the proportion is lower, keyword, than 45%. A study finds out that a random sample of 80 college students, 28 rent their books. This is not going to be useful until we do the actual hypothesis test. Right now, we're only writing the null and the alternate hypothesis. Write a null and alternate hypothesis to test the claim that 45% of college students rent their books. So the null hypothesis, the currently accepted fact, is that 45% of college students rent rather than buy their books. That's the claim that we are testing. So the null hypothesis, the proportion of students who rent rather than buy books is 0.45. This consumer group is saying this is not true, and they're claiming that the proportion is actually lower, that P is less than 0.45. Now, the e-commerce research company can claim whatever they want. Um, the um, book rental companies can claim whatever they want, but until we actually test these two hypotheses, the null and the alternative, we will never know which is the truth. Here's an introduction to the test statistic. The test statistic Z is equal to P hat minus P naught. So P hat is the sample proportion. P naught is the null or population proportion divided by the square root of p naught times 1 minus p naught. This is the same thing as q divided by n. And we've seen this before. This is the standard deviation of um, sample proportions. Now, the p value is extremely important. The p value of a hypothesis test is a probability of obtaining the observed value of our statistic or more extreme result by the chan by chance given that the null hypothesis is true. In other words, p-value is a probability that the data collected from the sample occurred just by chance given that the null hypothesis or the status quo belief is true. In the example, the man is innocent is a null hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis is that the man is not innocent. Then some evidence was collected. The prosecution has to prove that this evidence that was collected cannot, could not have been collected if the man was innocent. So the probability that this uh, evidence existed is very, very, very low if the man is in fact innocent. And that's what the p-value determines. If the p-value is extremely low, as defined by the significance level, which we'll talk about in class, then it's extremely unlikely that the sample data we observed occurred just by chance. And so we have evidence against the null hypothesis. So if this evidence that was collected, if this didn't happen by chance, if this is substantial, that means the man is not innocent, that the null hypothesis is actually false. If the p-value is extremely low, then it is likely that the sample data we observe occur by chance, and therefore there is not sufficient enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. There are three tails. We have a left tail, a right tail, and two tail, and we will talk more about this during class.